Lyft now operates in over half of the 50 states, and half of the company's executive leadership team are women. Lyft's Veronica Juarez takes the stage with City Lab editor at large, Richard Florida. Hey guys. Um, well, we're in for something of a treat. And uh, you all know that this city has been uh, a little bit challenged when it comes to ride sharing. And uh, no, it, it's really, and Veronica and I were talking, it's really a part of a new way of living that cities like Miami are, are adjusting to, which brings back some opportunities and some challenges. So we're very, very, very lucky to have Veronica Juarez um, with us here today. Veronica is with Lyft and she directs government affairs. She came in from San Francisco um, and uh, really organized the Lyft rollout here in Miami. Um, Veronica has uh, a great biography. She graduated from Stanford. Uh, she had a great career in politics mm -hmm. and in government affairs, both in California and in Texas. She's from Houston originally. And uh, she then joined Lyft in June 2013 and has been involved in the effort to roll out Lyft and their ride-sharing services uh, in this market and 50 other markets across the United States. So uh, I just want to start really, really basic, so forgive us, but, but for those of us who might not be familiar with Lyft, and, and there's another company that's penetrated this market whose name will, I will not use, uh, how is Lyft different in your view from other ride-sharing services. Sure. Well, first, thank you uh, for having me. You guys have great weather. I definitely don't want to leave. Um, you know, the very basic thing to understand about what we're trying to do is, is this. 80% of all uh, seats and personal vehicles on the road today are empty at all times. Our idea is that if you could connect people from common origins to common destinations along the same route, you can and start filling those empty seats, we would actually see the most efficient transportation system this generation has ever seen. Um, so that's, that's essentially what we're trying to do, and that's what the co-founders have been trying to do since 2007 from their first company, Zimride. So I think in a very, in a very basic way, that is very different than what anybody else is trying to do in the market. And we're already seeing this work, actually, in San Francisco, we've rolled out a product called LiftLine. And LiftLine, as a driver, will match, instead of you being matched with only one passenger, you can be matched with multiple passengers along the same route. And what we have found now is that over 50% of all of our rides in San Francisco are now LiftLine rides. Um, so as soon as we're able to reach scale in other markets, I think we'll see the same kind of success. So, so can I, I have plenty of other questions here, but yeah. that, that's really interesting. One of the things we find in, in our work in my own research, I, I called this group of people the creative class. And I said, you know, what, what this creative class is looking for is we live a, a, an anonymous or quasi-anonymous life. We go to a new city, we're alone, we want to make yeah. friends. Um, could this help us build community? Is that what, what is driving this? Is it people just wanting to save money or is it people wanting to have other people to talk to? What is driving the, the success of this new product? Yeah, I think there's a couple of reasons. Um, one is that having a car in, uh, in your own city is extremely expensive. So where, where teenagers used to see the owning their, getting their driver's license as a sign of their personal freedom, now they see that smartphone as a sign of their personal freedom. So we are actually seeing people delay the purchase of that first vehicle and actually delay getting their driver's license. Um, what would it look like? if you extrapolated that, for a family of four to delay the purchase of that second vehicle, because now they have more options to get around. Now they know if they're in a pinch, they can use bike share, or public transit, or Lyft, um, or a cab. So they could, they could fill in those gaps and actually save that money. Um, I think another reason is that people really yearn to connect. That's a very basic human condition. And for a while, with so much technology, it's like we would say this joke, instead of actually enjoying dinner, you're checking in on Facebook, like about the dinner that you're enjoying with your friends. And so... Can I Instagram yeah. our picture at dinner? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So things like Lyft and other things in the sharing economy actually use technology to bring us back together in real life. Um, and people enjoy that interaction. We encourage people, you don't have to, but we encourage people to sit in the front seat 
um, to really have a conversation you know, with this person, to make a connection. And the stories we have out of those connections that are made are endless. We are just now starting to skim the surface of what we will do and how we will be able to tell those stories. Well, you, you know, there's this, this great urban theorist named Jane Jacobs. She wrote this book in 1961 on her neighborhood in New York called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And she talked about the neighborhood characters mm -hmm. who, who gave animated that neighborhood, the, the, the guy in the pub or the tavern she went to, the, the hardware store. They're gone, right? And, and people I know think I'm crazy because I talk, well, when I used to take a cab, remember that? <laughs> like, I, I used to, like, talk, and I'm from New York, and I get in a cab, and I start talking to my cabbie like this, and what about the Knicks, and what about Mello, and people think I'm insane, but the driver, it's yeah. really, the driver is actually your touchstone. Like, I knew Toronto was going to elect the nut mayor they got rid of because the cab driver said, we like him, even though he's a nut. No, but, but I think what you're saying about this driver and sitting in the front seat is real. Could you expand upon where that comes from or how yeah. you guys thought of that? It's not obvious. Yeah, for sure. Um, if you think about what we're trying to do long term, if we're really trying to fill all the empty seats on the road, we want every single one of you who has a personal vehicle to apply and become approved as a Lyft driver so that when you are commuting somewhere, you feel comfortable flipping on your app, saying you're in driver mode, here's my destination, I would like to see any requests coming you know, so I can pick up a neighbor and sure, take them into downtown with me. In order for that to work, we have to be able to treat each other as equals. You know, I think another reason that that happens is because, and I love talking to regulators and elected officials about mm -hmm. this, is um, show me any other company that will come to your city um, and will leave 80% of all of the revenue generated on that platform with your residents in your hometown, like stimulating your local economy. And they can't think of another example. So the whole premise of this platform is it is an empowering tool for individuals and for community alike. Maybe this is a, an extreme example, but a lot of those regulators don't seem to get it. Like they're looking at this through an old school mentality. How do you, how do you help convince them? And maybe there's a constituency, I, I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe there's a constituency of incumbent people who are helping them be rigid and old school. How do you help them overcome that, these, these regulators who don't see it? Yeah, the you know incumbent industry. Every I think it's easy. <laughs> never said this out loud. I think it's easy for everyone to, everyone to say, oh, the incumbent industry, and they're so into you know the the political system. That is true. That is a factor. But the biggest factor when you are introducing new kinds of technologies and a completely new way of doing something is that somebody just has to become comfortable with it. You know, that's an education process between you and me. I mean, I don't know that five years ago I would have thought, oh yeah, I'm gonna use my smartphone and get a vehicle and jump in the, the front seat and fist bump and plug in my phone and play music and, you know, have this whole exchange, you know, like, and then ask them for recommendations on where I should go and like, that just doesn't, that, that didn't really cross my mind as something. And I think a lot, for a lot of us, that didn't seem normal, but now that's normalized. So, so when you're talking about changing your behavior in a really big way, people just need time to become comfortable with it. And I think too, when you're working with uh, governments and regulators, I've been doing this for a couple years now, um, there's gonna be a natural tension there. They want to regulate for public safety and account for all of these things, and the easiest way to do that is like, well, we've always done it this way, so why don't we just continue to do it this way? So, you know, you work with them and edit well, if you do it that way, then you're not gonna create a system where we're allowed to innovate and create new solutions to help solve your big public challenges. Um, so maybe there's a different way that we can do it. So, you know, what we really do is just is try to navigate that tension as delicately as possible. So what do you think, you've hinted at this, what do you think is driving this for your company and, and sharing services? You know, we can go down the list. Is it generational? Mm -hmm. Is it money? Um, you, you mentioned flexibility. What do you mm -hmm. think are, because it's huge. You know, I think of, they asked me today to write something for Fast Company about design. And I said, you know it's really innovative when you don't understand how you could have lived without it. Like it changed, right? that's what you guys, how, yeah. how could I have lived <laughs> like this? And that's what you guys have done. Like, how did I live without this thing? But what do you think as a driver? Are you seeing more young people? Are you seeing it in certain urban markets versus other markets? 
Are you seeing families use it? Are you seeing a particular kind of worker use it? What is right. driving this change? Oh, I think it's across the board. Uh, two, two, two big reasons. One, um, I think fundamentally people are changing the way they get around. Having, paying for transportation is one of the largest household expenses, but we know for low-income families, they can spend up to a third of their household income on transportation. What does that mean for them if they were able to alleviate that, that um, burden? You know, what could they then spend money on? So that's, that's a huge thing. Um, the second is that we know that people are changing the way that they work, and they're changing the way that they spend the t their time, and they're changing the way that they make money. So here's, I mean, there's some neat facts that we've had as we started to run these numbers. 30% of all the drivers in San Francisco label themselves as uh, part, being part of the creative class. In LA, that number is... That's really interesting. In LA, that number is 60%. So, you know, and we know that our average driver is driving less than 10 hours a week. So your drivers have, uh, it's really, uh, your yeah, drivers yeah. have other occupations. This is one of a, I'm assuming a portfolio, when you said this, they're a portfolio. It's not like they have a, a single career. They're mixing incomes by... Um... Most definitely. Multiple sources of income. So we know, you know, flexibility is the new stability. This is how people are changing the way that they make money. We, um, last year in New York, partnered with an organization called the Freelancers Union. Um, and they... Is, that Har Sarah, is it Sarah, Sarah Harwood? Sarah yep. Harwood, yeah. And they... Um, are continuously thinking through ways of how to support this new growing class of a working community. Um, and I think it's like their average member has between three and six sources of income a month. So this is, you know, this is not new. Somebody being a part of Lyft or taking advantage of Airbnb or, you know, working in other sharing economy spaces, now it creates for them a freedom a freedom for how they spend their time, how they can pursue other passions, how they can connect with community. Maybe they're an artist and they get to interact with all these people in their city and talk about their work. It's really interesting. The, the best criticism of my work on the creative class came from a young man in Austin who said, I got Austin wrong. We both, we both like Austin. Yeah. And he said, Florida talks about these creatives, but it's really uh, companies like Whole Foods, he used Whole Foods as an example, that give you a good job, but, but that you can, you can stay out late. You don't have to come in yeah. at 8 in the morning. They, they support your music. And so in a way, Lyft provides this source of income. Not guaranteed, but it provides this additional source of income sure. that, that people can use to support their career. Is that part of your strategy, or did it just happen? Oh, you know, I think it just happened organically, really. And, you know, what, what we are also seeing that... that people don't recognize is the use case for Lyft on both the driver and the passenger side. I mean, you'll have the mom with children who doesn't have a job, but will drive, can drive during the day, or maybe puts the kids at night and then, you know, will turn on the app. Um, then you have seniors, people with disabilities, who have all told us this has fundamentally changed their quality of life. I met a woman in Seattle who um, is blind, and her husband is blind, and she has two small children under the age of three. And the, the fact that Lyft uh, was now in her city made it possible, she said, she testified at a city council hearing, made it possible for her to take her, her um, daughter to gymnastics class and to other after-school programs, and it made her feel like she was a better mom because she could provide these experiences because of what we're doing. So, you know, there's, there's just so many ways in which we are starting to see people's lives change because this is available. So I want to shift gears just a little. You, uh, you seem like you like Miami. You actually, <laughs> you actually seem like you, you fit really well here. I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, you do. And, and um, um, I'm only saying... It's easy living. <laughs> um, no, but we, we talked. And, and so you've, you come from Houston. You went to Stanford, you live in San Francisco, and from your observations, mm -hmm. really your honest observation, take your lift, put, keep it on, take it off, how would you compare where, what, this, what you've seen as the assets, but if we want to grow a startup, you know, what, we're different than San Francisco. Oh, for sure. In some ways we're not as good, some ways we're better. What would you see as some of the things you, you might see are assets or, or, or constraints on us growing this startup system here? Yeah, um, there's two things that I think just make it a slam dunk for us. Um, you guys have a very vibrant community. Um, I was in the design district over the weekend, and there's a natural creative energy here. So that's, you know, that's huge. That's huge for, for accepting something that's new and embracing it. Um, 
Secondly, I would say, you know, the personality of this city is to be very friendly. Um, and, you know, we have always been extremely collaborative in our approach um, and that the way we work with communities. When we launch a new city, my goal is really to become a fabric to integrate ourselves into the fabric of that community. Um, so I think, you know, I think that Miami is really ripe for Lyft to, to not only succeed, um, but to really grow. I mean, because part of what we want to do is, is connect people, not just in city centers where, oh, the millennials or the people who are here for Ultra get to you know, have an easy way to get around. No, we want to make it possible for if you have to commute you know, 30 minutes every day, that Lyft is now an option for you to share a ride and to make money on that commute. When we launched Driver Destination in LA, which I love to talk about because LA is a sprawl, everyone said, oh, I don't think Lyft's going to work in LA. It's so sprawling. But when we launched, um, uh, a young woman driver there who you would only drive after hours after her regular job used it on her commute and in two days using driver destination made $60. That's huge. I would like to see that opportunity for um, the residents in Miami and, the, and surrounding areas. Yeah, and you've hinted at this and then we'll get throw it up for questions in just one second but I actually think there's a big social agenda, and I never thought about this before, and I think I'm pretty clever, that you guys could take on. People have always talked about the so-called spatial mismatch between where poor people live and where jobs are. Had the, the story about that poor man who had to walk 25 miles, which you read on every news outlet from Detroit, um, even perhaps in some cases with a little government assistance, you could really see the kind of service you provide as matching people who, we know that there's communities that are highly disadvantaged and remain that way over generations, matching people with those communities with the need to get to other places to work. Most definitely, and matching of public transit stops. So in San Jose, for example, two-thirds of all of our rides in San Jose and the South Bay are to and from Caltrain stations. So we are actually taking people to and from that large public transit hub. Cool. Uh, folks, do you want to jump in? It's, it's really fascinating. <laughs> I can see at least three articles I can write for City Lab. Go easy on me. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, hello, my name is Jessica Kizorek, uh, and I love the, how you talked about the opportunities. How do you sort of mitigate the risks and the people being scared about, you know, uh, taking a ride with someone you don't know, but how is that even different from taking a cab, really? Yeah, so, you know, I, I don't love to compare, but um, I will tell you what we do, and then what I, what I, how I typically address that question is I really review what it is that we do for safety, and then you think through what your experience is in another provider, and you can make that decision. Um, so we do a criminal background check, uh, and that's done on multiple levels. We actually do a really exhaustive county by county check that is more exhaustive than what most people do to, for jobs or even you know, to work at the FBI. Um, a national sex offender registry, blah, blah, blah. We do a DMV check. You can only have three minor violations. One of my colleagues, she's so funny, she's like, my mom applied to be a Lyft driver but like had too many speeding tickets, so you know, she didn't make it. Um, a vehicle inspection will match you with somebody who is uh, a seasoned driver as a mentor in that area and actually have them meet in person. Um, after you have passed all of those checks, then we will onboard you um, to be able to flip on the app and, and drive on the platform. Um, once you are actually in a ride, and this is what, what I love because I'm typically traveling alone in a city that I don't live in, is that you can call your driver, you, can, you have live GPS tracking, so I know at all points in time, somebody knows exactly where I am. And that's huge for me, because maybe it's at night, maybe it was after a work dinner and I'm getting back to you know, my hotel. I know that somebody knows where I am and where that driver is. And then we have live feedback, so you're constantly exchanging that information and we're constantly reviewing it. If there's a problem or an issue, we will disable a, an account as we investigate that issue and find out exactly what happened. Um, so there's just, just a myriad of ways that we're constantly improving and pushing on safety and people's positive experience. And that goes for passengers as well, so you don't get to get in a Lyft vehicle and not behave well. You know, we want to hold everyone accountable, so we will disable passengers as well. Hi, my name is Alejandro Armini. Uh, I work for Salo. We're a boat sharing marketplace. We're in the same sharing economy. Wait, uh, boat sharing? Yeah. Oh, we, we should talk. Uh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> well, my question is, you, you've been talking about Liftline and about how it's kind of like a way for 
um, many people to, to be able to use Lyft. Do you guys have plans of like, because right now things like Lyft and Uber are kind of used for more uh, middle class, higher income people. Do you guys have plans to like take us to lower income people, ways for them to avoid riding the bus? You know, public personal transportation it would be like an amazing thing to accomplish. Yeah. Uh, and what are your guys' plans in that space? Yeah, we want to do that um, for every city, not just Miami. We want to make that an option that's available. Um, what has to happen first, though, is you have to reach a critical mass of users. So we have to reach a place in Miami where there's enough people using the product um, that we can then expand it from there. Um, it's really hard to start matching people real time, like, oh, okay, we're going to match these you know, two people together with this driver if there's not enough people on the system that, are, that have adapted it yet. So we're able like, to test it. I mean, we launched it in San Francisco a couple of months ago, um, and that has been how our longest market that we have been in to date. We've been in San Francisco about two and a half years. Uh, so once we reach that scale in other markets, then we'll be able to test all of those products, which are, yes, definitely more affordable. So Lyft Line is like 30 or 40% less than, than a Lyft. Um, and then you would see those, those prices drop as more and more people used it. Isn't it amazing in this place? We we don't use boats. I mean, isn't that sort of striking to you that New York is expanding ferry service mm -hmm. and using ferry service? And thanks for the boat. I'm in for the boat sharing, for sure. But <laughs> I can't afford a boat. Uh, I can afford a car, but not a boat. Um, but it's sort of amazing that we don't use the water. So I think you're up to something good. And it, what's really amazes me, Veronica, is, is, is how there were two European professors. They wrote this amazing article about why the US has a higher rate of startups. They said it wasn't just hardware and computers and iPhones. It was that something was happening in US cities. Um, Airbnb would be one example. You guys would be another great example. And it wasn't just sharing. And I think you said this better than anyone I've ever talked to about this. It was the about of making our cities work more efficiently. That the problem wasn't to invent a new gizmo. It was to invent this new way of sharing mm -hmm. a ride or, or making a person a, a driver to supplement their income. Or your point about helping turn this into something that had more of a public or social mission. And I really think that's what we're up to. It's, it's not just about technology for technology's sake. It's about this frontier, this new frontier called the city and how we make it work. Veronica, I just want to say thank you. It's been, it's been a pleasure talking with you and getting to know you. And I think all of us hope you spend a little bit more time here. We know you like the city. Spend <laughs> yeah, a little no, bit more definitely. time here. Thank you. thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. No, thanks so much. Which way? This way?